Hey everyone, welcome back to FPL Fran. Today's video is going to be the Game Week 29 cheat sheet, but because this is such a popular week to free hit, I thought it would make sense to have two different segments for today's video. One, the regular rolling segment where we just look at the usual positions, taking into account future fixtures and other plans and so forth. And also a segment entirely attributed towards Game Week 29 free hit, allowing you to have a look at, for me, the best picks within the free hit, but then also potential differentials that you could be looking at particularly if you want to go for even crazier options in terms of effective ownership. Starting with the free hit section, we do want to talk about, first of all, the fixtures. We only have four fixtures, and ultimately, just even from a defense point of view, we're not expecting many clean sheets here. So I think when you're picking defenders, the best approach here is to actually look for defenders who have attacking upside. As far as the midfielders and attackers, you're just looking at attacking these pretty weak defenses. The only defense that actually has clean sheet odds above 25% is Brentford, but they're not too far apart from some of the other teams. So actually, this is a good week really to just pick eight attackers and maximize on hopefully weaker opponents. So a team like Luton, for example, who have been a very frail defense this season are worth targeting still, or even within the context of a team like Aston Villa, who have suffered recent defensive injuries, they would be a great team to target. And you can simply look at this as a chance to target teams where it's very likely that both teams will score. So starting with the midfield here in the free hit position, we have unfortunately, uh, a pick that some people might not like, but it's Gibbs White. Gibbs White is interesting because unfortunately we've seen Elanga substitutions. We've also seen Hudson Odoi substitutions recently. And part of this has been a reflection of Nuno's attitude towards how deep the squad is and, and how much he's mentioned that he has different options now from a tactical perspective. And that has sort of changed, in my opinion, the strength of both Elanga and Hudson Odoi on this free hit. Whereas Gibbs White still seems to be one of the more central and, and creative options within this team not necessarily just through open play but more so through set pieces things like corners and we also have i would say a, a small uncertainty of whether he's still the penalty taker for this nottingham forest team because going back to last season he actually became the official penalty taker for the team but we also know that since then chris wood has joined and i also think that nuno has a preference towards chris wood as well so i'll mention chris wood in the forward segment later but there's a high chance that gibbs white continues to have penalties and that makes him a very very good pick when you're targeting a luton team here as far as, let's say, some of the West Ham picks or even the Aston Villa picks, I think a lot of the asterisks around them generally will be around what happens within the midweek game within Europe, right? Because West Ham will be facing Freiburg once again, Aston Villa will be facing Ajax, and we'll have to see what the results are of those games. For example, if, if certain players go towards extra time, if some of these fixtures unfortunately mean that, let's say, a, a Douglas Luiz is playing extra time, or rather a, a Bailey specifically, or a Kudush is playing extra time, I think the, the impact of course is that they might need to be rested on the Game Week 29 fixture because it's very unlikely that some players outside of a Bowen or a Watkins will be playing you know 90 minutes back and forth um, or even Paqueta for example these are players that I would expect to be nailed and that's why the cheat sheet also sort of reflects this I think Bailey is interesting because we still rate the Aston Villa attack very highly from a sort of team XG perspective and he does bring a lot to the table when you look at expected goal involvement per 90 and because he's so far ahead of his peers in this category I still think that Bailey with reduced minutes is someone who absolutely deserves to be a green asset this week so Gibbs White obviously is a great pick Douglas Luiz a very similar version of this pick but unfortunately with a worse fixture this week on paper in terms of the home and away aspect uh, but potentially someone that you actually might like more because if you look at the expected goal involvement per 90 still a touch better than Gibbs White anyways this season but Part of the slicing of this has been the penalties that have been given towards Douglas Luiz compared to Gibbs White, who's only taken one penalty this season. As far as Paqueta, we do expect him to be on penalties as well. So I think given that he, we expect him to also play both fixtures, he's actually an option that I quite like when if you're targeting West Ham. The only question, I suppose, is whether you want to double up on West Ham or whether you'd like to diversify a bit more by maybe siding with the stronger team in Aston Villa here. And of course, there's a chance here, in my opinion, to go with either Paqueta Bailey or Douglas Luiz. I think these are all great options. As I said, Paqueta is the person I expect to be on penalties, but we have, of course, seen uh, Ward Prowse deputize and take penalties during his absence. So there might be a change of the guard there, but I would still assume that Paqueta is on penalties. The most locked picks for this week, though, will be Bowen, Madison, and Son. Bowen, as you can still see, has really consistent underlying stats. So even when you compare it to, let's say, his peers in Paqueta, Ward Prowse, and even Akudush, he actually still has the best underlying stats. So if you were to target a West Ham attacker, even though Bowen has been dismaying outside of the hat trick, I still think that he's a player to go for from this West Ham team. As far as Madison and Son, these are players who are still non-negotiables for me. And, and part of that is because, of course, Madison is now reassuming a lot of these set-piece duties. And we've also seen that ultimately over the course of the season, he's had really good underlying stats. Yes, of course, a little bit of a drop-off compared to last season. But right now, given the fact that he has some intangibles in place and also 
ultimately Spurs are probably the the attack of choice um, out of all, all eight teams here. I think Madison's probably the best pick to go for. And you can also guarantee the minutes with Madison. Whereas I would say when you compare it to, let's say, other Spurs options, let's say attackers like Kuduszewski. Yes, of course, Kuduszewski might get 90 minutes. But the concern is, once again, underlying stats that don't really compare too well towards Madison. And if you look across the board to, let's say, players like Werner and Brennan Johnson, those two players, I think, are very interesting, particularly Johnson, part, uh, if you look at underlying stats. However, I think the concern with, let's say, someone like Werner is that you're actually dealing with more, more threats in, in the forward position. I think this is more of a week to go for 3-4-3, although 3-5-2 is perfectly viable. And because of that, I, I just don't like Werner that much. I don't also like triple Spurs attack. I'd much rather have one Spurs defender because, for me, Pedro Porro is an extremely valuable asset week to week. Whereas Madison, for me, is a lock. And Son, of course, I mean, I don't think I need to mention him. Of course, had an extremely good game week last week out. Doesn't mean that he's not going to have one this week again. Uh, he is the main threat here. We expect him to be on penalties. Just nothing more to be said. And, and as far as the yellow tier picks, we have got Barkley, Alanga, and Kudush. And, and the only thing I'd say about Alanga is that his underlying stats have been very positive. So when you compare it to, for example, some of the other Nottingham Forest players, he actually has really good stats. And of course, as you can see, some of the other peers in this category very, very good XGI per 90 across the board. So that's a really huge positive for Langa. But now, of course, with the, the previous benching, the concern, of course, is going to be what sort of structure Nuno is going to operate in. Now, this Luton team have been very poor from a defensive point of view, and it might actually make more sense for this Nottingham Forest team to, let's say, lose a little bit more midfield control. Because if you look towards, let's say, Nuno's previous press conference, he mentions a lot about how the, the benchings of Hudson Odoi and Langa are related to midfield control. Whereas in this fixture here, I think you are looking to attack a Luton team that are still very frail on defense and are able to be hit on the counter because they also play quite expansive football themselves. So I do like Alanga as a shout, but once again, you can't guarantee a start. However, I think if you can guarantee a start from Alanga, particularly on the basis of, let's say, potential leaks, then he actually becomes an extremely good pick. Kudus, I think one thing that concerns me, as I said, is he doesn't really have those intangibles in FPL that make him that much of a star-studded pick. Now, he did go through a red-hot run before he actually went to AFCON, and he even played relatively well within AFCON, unfortunately, even though his country and nation were sent out early. My concern, once again, is that if you look at the underlying stats, it is pretty dismaying, and ultimately, he is also a player who doesn't have, for example, additional set pieces. And he also has a pretty tough fixture in the context of this game week. So I don't like Kudush that much as a pick, and I do prefer Paqueta and Bowen ahead of him, and I'm very unlikely to, for example, go for a triple up at West Ham. So if I was to prioritize, let's say, two players, I still would put Paqueta above him in the pecking order. And then finally, with the orange picks here, these are the absolute differentials. And I think one asterisk should be added towards Lewis Potter here, who a lot of people will be surprised to see, but actually he is someone who could potentially play, you know, in a fullback role for this Brentford team, but also... He actually is an interesting pick just because he has some set pieces for this Brentford team as well. His underlying stats are actually pretty decent. And I think if, let's say, Reglon is out, you can potentially guarantee 90 minutes from Lewis Potter. However, the flip side, of course, is that you're just basically waiting for Thomas Frank news. And it also depends on how you plan to triple up on Brentford because Brentford arguably have um, one of the easier fixtures of this week, given that they're actually facing Burnley, the sort of second worst team when it comes to defense and even the second worst team when it comes to offense. So that's something to think about. I would say right now, Lewis Potter is definitely a punt that I would consider if, let's say, Mbumo is guaranteed to be out. And if you don't really want to go for Flecken as a pick, because if you're going to for a triple up of Brentford, I would probably be maximizing on that by going for Tony, uh, potentially one defender in Regulon or Rorslev. And we'll talk about the other two, uh, those two options later, but then also potentially an attacker or either Flecken as a goalkeeper. The chance here with Lewis Potter is that you have, once again, another player who has these sort of intangibles in FPL and, and can be quite an interesting pick. With Ward-Prowse, unfortunately, with sort of the reduction in set pieces due to Paqueta coming back in and uncertainty over there, I still don't think he's that interesting. With Iwobi, I think the fixture is just the, the thing that makes this a hard sell. He has really good underlying stats and he has really good minutes compared to some of the other Fulham midfielders. So whilst you can consider players like Harry Wilson, Andreas Pereira, or even William. I do think Iwobi still has really good underlying stats. And even if you look towards as, as recently as the Wolves game, he is the player with the, with the best expected goal involvement. So we usually traditionally see Iwobi as more of a workhorse in the midfield, but his role in the team actually still means that he's garnered a lot of expected goal involvement. And I do like Iwobi a lot as a pick in general, particularly if you were to look at a, a very sort of closeted situation like this, where you have eight teams and you only have a few players to pick with. And he could be a one good differential to look at. Hudson Odoi, I think, is almost like an inferior version of Elanga. Although, of course, there's going to be weeks where he's going to overperform. And 
I'm just not that confident that he will do it this week. And that's why he sits in this orange tier with Kuliszewski. As I've described, him and Werner are in unique positions where, first of all, Kuliszewski has poor underlying stats, whereas Werner, I think, has poor minutes. And so the combination of the two just means that all the options really do pale in comparison. I do think Brennan Johnson deserves a mention here. I have it added him to the cheat sheet, but I think if you can confirm, for example, Brennan Johnson start, I could sort of understand someone shifting from a sort of uh, Madison plus Sun plus Poro slash Udogi structure into a triple Spurs attack on that basis because he is a very interesting pick and he actually does have good underlying stats compared to, let's say, Kuliszewski, although I still think it's a, it's a little bit of a hard sell for me. As far as the forward position here for the, for the free hit, it is a little bit easier here to, to pick the options. I think Tony and Watkins for me are locks, and that's simply because Tony's on penalties, even though his underlying stats have been really subpar. However, of course, you, you can mention, of course, that Wiesa has, has recently built up a lot of form. Fofana himself has done incredibly well for this Burnley team. And someone like Muniz has seemingly locked down, you know, a sort of spot within the team where he's going to play 90 minutes. Now, the concern, of course, is that some other players are actually coming back to the team slowly. For example, Jimenez. Broya himself has also been sitting on the bench. And I, I, I think... One, th one way you can look at this, of course, is that it's very unlikely that Muniz is going to be substituted because it's probably more than likely that the Spurs team is going to be leading versus Fulham. And once again, when you're put in, in a position where you're actually chasing the game, uh, a player like Muniz is probably going to stay on the field as opposed to be being taken off and actually being replaced, you know, as a like-for-like -like substitute with someone like Armando Broya. So I do like Muniz a lot as a pick, but then I also think that when it comes to the ceiling, once again, the Spurs defense is ironically still one of the better defenses within this game week. And I still probably wouldn't tar target Muniz on this basis. Morris is someone that we know is guaranteed on penalties. Wood as well is someone that I think with a little bit of uncertainty is probably 50, 40% on penalties. And because of that, I think Wood makes for a very interesting pick because as I mentioned, Luton and Town are the team to target from a defensive point of view. They are the second worst defense in town. And they're still a really good team to target because even though Nottingham Forest have been pretty poor in the attacking point of view, um, you can see, of course, that there's a huge gulf between, let's say, even a team like Burnley and Luton and, of course, Sheffield United. Luton and Sheffield United are, are those two teams that are uniquely poor at defense this season uh, and historically bad as well. So I think if you wanted to say that Nottingham Forest are a boring attacking team, the reality is this is the chance for them to sort of uh, rewrite that story, at least for this game week. So I like Wood a lot as an option. His underlying stats have been really consistent too. Very similar and very close to a player like Morris this season. And that's interesting. Another thing too that I'll mention is that Wood has basically played every effective minute possible under Nuno. So I think whilst there's a bit of concern over Wood's minutes, because of the sort of double striker or even the three strikers that they have at the club, Taiwo and of course Wood are, are your options. And I still think that there's a preference for Wood and Wood will get 90 minutes. Now, you might not believe that. You might think that Taiwo will replace him during the game, um, but that's sort of sort of where I'm leaning to right now. Or at the bare minimum, I think we'll see Wood play for 80 minutes. As far as Tony and Watkins, as I said, they're locks with Fafana and Wisa, once again, differentials, but I'm not sure if I would necessarily be going there. I still think that there are stronger picks than Fofana. And when it comes to Wisa, of course, it sort of does affect how you go about you know, this triple Brentford structure. Another thing to mention too is I think with Wisa, one of the concerns is that unfortunately he's not as important to his team when it comes to sort of securing the full 90 minutes. You might be seeing Wisa being an early substitution in many situations where let's say if Brentford are struggling to actually break open the game, you'll see Mope as a much earlier substitution than you would um, if Wisa was, let's say, already scoring a goal and, and playing well. So that is a concern there that there is quite a bit of drawback to going for Wisa, whereas I don't think that necessarily applies to options like Muniz, Morris, and Wood. And in terms of defensive position, once again, I think this is also a little bit more routine. So we've got Doughty, who I like a lot just simply because when you look at all the defenders here in this sphere, one of the interesting things, of course, is these are all great attacking fullbacks. And the reason why we're looking at these attacking fullbacks is because we don't really have many good options this week in terms of central back, uh, central defenders, and we don't have many good options in terms of the clean sheet odds. The clean sheet odds this week for teams are all, as I said, below 25%, with exception to Brentford, who I believe have you know, a 26, 27% chance to get a clean sheet. This is vastly inferior to what we usually get for a team like City, a team like Arsenal, or even some middling, middling teams with better fixtures. So let's say if Aston Villa, for example, were playing at home to another team or, or even with the same fixture, I think you'd see clean sheet odds, you know, above 30%, which is very normal for teams actually. But because these fixtures are so bad from that perspective, it just makes sense to go for your attacking assets who probably on average would give you good chances to getting attacking points in FPL. So Doughty for me is still an option that I would absolutely consider. Part of that too, of course, is that Nottingham Forest are a bit of a blunt edge in terms of their attacking point of view, in, in terms of their attacking. So I think it's, it's a good little hedge here, even if you were to go for an attacking sort of midfielder or 
even a Chris Wood from a Nottingham Forest. Udogi and Poro are my elite options. I would still prefer Poro, even though he seemingly hasn't recovered set pieces. I think Madison and Kulishevsky were taking set pieces last week, as far as I could see in the Spurs match. And that might make Poro a slightly worse option. But even before he actually assumed set pieces when Madison was injured, one thing that I'll mention too is that Poro always had better underlying stats than Udogi. So if you wanted to be unbiased, I think Poro is still actually the pick that I would go with over Udogi. Yes, of course, Udogi likes to make that sort of overlapping run. And that could, of course find himself, you know, one-on-one -on -one with the keeper or in really good positions. And that might be what you are hoping for in this game week. So I don't think there's too much to sort of split between them, but I would still go with Poro um, if I had to take my chances. Udogi, however, will give you a little bit more differentialness in terms of just the effective ownership of Poro compared to Udogi right now. With Regulon, I've added an asterisk towards him because I think he is by far the the best defender of this week if he if we get if we knew for sure that he was going to start. His underlying stats this season with Brentford have been really, really positive. And once again, we mentioned that Brentford actually have one of the better clean sheet odds this week. And on top of that, too, I think just just stylistically watching him play recently, he just does seem to actually be a player who's almost like the third or fourth attacker within this Brentford team. Gets onto the end of things as, as a left winger or left inside forward almost. And I've seen him crack a lot of shots. And with even within the small sample size of this Brentford team, I would say... Very much like a uh, like a Ryan Knight Nuri, for example, that you're you're going for someone who is going to give you some attacking dividends. Whereas with Roslev, we have seen attacking dividends as well. We have also seen decent underlying stats, although it's actually worse compared to any of the other green options here. But the case, of course, is if Regulon is not confirmed to start this Burnley fixture, then you can simply just move on to a Roslev here or go Roslev and um, Lewis Potter, who I mentioned in the midfield bracket, who actually assumed the sort of left wing back position in the previous week when he was playing versus Arsenal. Now, in the yellow tier, we have some other more differential players. I personally would not go for them because ultimately this is a week where you're going for a 3-4-3, in my opinion, or a 3-5-2. And it's very hard to even extend beyond the green picks here. But I think if you really want to go for differentials, as again, you don't really want to have any sort of effective ownership at all. I think Nico Williams is an interesting option. He's someone who has sort of locked down a starting spot within this team, very consistently played 90 minutes, and of course is an attacking fullback as well with decent underlying stats. With Romero, of course, you're just looking for, once again, a route towards the Spurs defense, a person who, of course, is a huge set-piece threat, but someone who also does really well in terms of racking up bonus. And a lot of that is just simply due to the defensive work that he pulls out game on game. And that's, of course, a huge positive if you're seeing somehow a chance, for example, for Spurs to get a clean sheet again, which they did actually just versus Aston Villa most recently. With Ayer, I think you're also targeting potentially how bad Burnley are at set pieces. They're actually the worst team in the league in set pieces. So if you, let's say, don't want to put your faith in an attacking fullback with really good expected goal involvement, you can obviously go for a Brentford center back as well. Ayer is probably the pick that I would go with. But that's about it. As far as the sort of pure differentials here, I think you, you can once again look towards, let's say, the European fixtures to maybe get a glimpse of, of who you think would play. And another thing, too, of course, is if you're, let's say, hedging versus specific teams, let's say you don't back West Ham at all, I think you can obviously go for some Aston Villa defenders. They're not too far off some of the top options in terms of that yellow bracket, but I still think that I probably wouldn't go with an Aston Villa defender this week. They, their defense just seems to be really poor, particularly after the loss of Kamara. So, Pow and Cash are the two options that I'd have. Of course, with the Cash, we always know that there's a little bit of risk at attached. We did see him actually play the full game out in the previous fixture, but he's also accumulated a lot of minutes recently. So if there was an, ever an opportunity for him to be rested, I think it would make sense for him to be rested after the European fixture because they now have a couple more options to sort of rotate around. And even Konza, for example, is back in the team. With Pau, we're seeing him back fit. So you're looking at a player who, of course, is still a set-piece threat, but um, ultimately you're looking at a centre-back with a pretty you know, suboptimal fixture when it comes to clean sheets. As far as Zuma, you're purely preying on attacking threat. And as far as Robinson, you're almost hedging against the Spurs attack entirely. So I find that very hard to believe that you'd want to do that. But Robinson, of course, is one of the more capable fullbacks within the league. Underlying stats still a little bit subpar, though, but... Ultimately, it comes to, you know, what do you want from this fixtures and whether you really want to seek a differential for the purpose of seeking a differential versus, let's say, going for a regular pick. And then in the goalkeepers, I think this is very simple. I talked about clean sheet odds. I think your keepers here are super close. I put Fleck and Cells, Ariela Martinez as my preferred keepers. If you want to go differential, once again, you've got options like Trafford, Kaminsky, Leno, Vicario. Um, Vicario, the only reason why I don't like him is because you want to maximize, I think, you know, how good your three Spurs options are in terms of point ceilings. And I don't think he provides that necessarily unless he's able to re replicate, for example, one of Ariola's masterclass performances from the season. So that's pretty much it for the free hit element of the cheat sheet.
let's quickly move on to the main portion of the cheat sheet. All right, so now moving on to the main section of the cheat sheet, what we have, of course, is a little bit of understanding that Blank Gaming 29 means you might be investing into some players, but I also think that you shouldn't over-invest into Gaming 29. So if you, let's say, have six or seven players this week, I wouldn't really stretch myself towards too many hits unless the hits are involved for Spurs players who actually will probably be very good um, for the future. However, if you're, let's say, investing into further West Ham players or maybe Aston Villa players as well, you might not actually want to keep these assets for too long because, for example, outside of, let's say, owning Watkins and Game Week 30 being a good example of an Aston Villa fixture, you probably actually want to be hedging and, and investing into teams who are either playing Game Week 34 or 37, depending on your free hit strategy. So I think uh, a slow move towards, let's say, a long-term strategy does make sense. And some of the changes on the cheat sheet will be reflective, of course, of imminent fixtures that we expect. So um, keep in mind, of course, we still don't know the perfect landscape of 34 and 37 and how the fixtures will fall. But as I've sort of dedicated to my previous videos, we do expect, generally speaking, a double game week in game week 34 for United, Crystal Palace, Newcastle, Sheffield United, these sorts of teams. Now, there, of course, could be another Chelsea fixture being added in around there. And of course, we need to think about that in terms of game weeks 35 and 36. But for the time being, of course, this is sort of our understanding of the landscape. So these are the teams that we're interested in or a little bit more interested in than usual. Now, if you're going for a free at 34 approach, though, you can probably also avoid needing to move into teams uh, or certain players outside of, let's say, Chelsea. Uh, or maybe Newcastle who generally have a good run of fixtures um, and you can look towards going for Liverpool and City assets as well but let's get started with the cheat sheet in the midfield section we have Garnacho with a rise and part of that as I said of course is just as being a United player and now of course looking ahead at some decent fixtures but unfortunately away fixtures as well you have the chance to go into Garnacho who's going to be once again your sort of budget main piece for um, your team we have options like Palmer as well who we've already kept at the top of the cheat sheet for a while now I mean, the reality is you're going to have players like Garnacho and Palmer. You're also going to have a very cheap core in the midfield, and you should and you should still be able to afford players like Salah or Holland, depending on the one medium you're going for. Or if you're on a two medium structure, you're going to sacrifice certain players. But these are the players who would be glue guys within your team who can definitely play whenever they have good fixtures. As far as Barkley, he drops, even though he's actually got a really good fixture here with Gaming 29. I think if you've been keeping Barkley for a while, of course, you're looking at Gaming 29 as effectively uh, that sort of last window before you move Barkley on to potentially a more expensive asset or someone like a Garnacho as well, just to sort of um, fix the, your team. If you were, let's say, moving um, into options like Douglas Luiz or Bailey, I would not necessarily recommend that because, of course, um, as I said, the Aston Villa run is sort of coming towards a close and you do want to be investing into teams that have more expected fixtures in the future. As far as, let's say, Gordon, one of the issues, of course, is that we saw him succumb to an injury, a knee injury in specific within the Chelsea game. It doesn't seem to be as bad as a potential ACL injury, although we did hear, of course, from Eddie, who, of course, is a little bit unreliable, too, that he seems to have a pretty serious injury and that it will need a scan, of course. Now, Gordon's going to be a great pick if he's fit in, in two, three weeks' time. However, there is a genuine concern that he's out for a while and that means we're going to be looking at other that that means we're going to be looking at instead some other newcastle midfielders so a murphy for example could be more important because barnes also succumbed to an injury um, it might also strengthen the position of libramento within the team as well given that dan Byrne has also succumbed to an injury so things like that will have knock-on impacts particularly these injuries and once we know the time frame of these newcastle injuries we can sort of reassess with newcastle because when you look at the fixture run from gaming 30 and 31 I'm really, really good already there. And then we're expecting, of course, a double game of 34. As far as Eze, he's been added to the cheat sheet. The reason why I've been keeping him off the cheat sheet is simply because I really wanted to wait for him to actually play at least one full game of football. He's now played two. He came um, and, and played 65 minutes in the first game and then and effectively played much more in the second, which is obviously a positive sign. It just shows that he's rebuilding his fitness. Obviously, the concern and the caveat is that, once again, he might, you know, succumb to injury again. And that's what happened when I owned him, for example, after the Sheffield United fixture, where he had already played four or five fixtures in a row. And the concern, of course, is how many minutes he's going to play, how he'll be managed going forwards. Hopefully, he'll be fine. And Eze is going to be a great pick because we're expecting, as I said, a double game of 34 for Crystal Palace. For Gross, I haven't dropped him yet. But as you can see, of course, fixtures do get worse for Brighton. Potentially... Um, if we're being generous to, to Gross, he, he, he's actually a, a pick that you don't necessarily need to get rid of immediately because he's just a generally good FPL pick. 
but closer, of course, towards the doubles. And depending on where, for example, a game like Chelsea versus Brighton falls, you might change your opinion on whether Gross belongs in your team. It might make more sense to hedge towards picks who actually will play in double gaming features, or of course, simply move to cheaper options who um, will allow you to get your sort of main premium options as well in other areas of the field. As far as a Bowen, for example, still so good for gaming 29, in general, decent fixtures when it comes to sort of the quality of opponents. I think even with Aston Villa, we have to say that they're, they're a declining defense. They also play in midweek, um, even though Bowen himself is, is participating towards that. Uh, however, Newcastle and Tottenham still get fixtures on, on, on the run. I would still say, though, that Bowen is probably going to be a sell in gaming 30 because he's also a very expensive asset. And in reality, you probably want to be looking at Bowen as a sell once again on gaming 30. But gaming 29, immediately good fixture. After that, you know, reconsider, of course, his position on your team and whether you can actually move towards other picks. Even, for example, the chance to move to Richarlison, if, let's say, he's back in Game 30, I think is quite interesting. If you can't stretch towards, let's say, a, a, a rid ridiculous transfer like a Bowen to Salah. As far as Havertz, he's also been given a rise. And, and the reason, even though we have, of course, the City game, uh, you know, in the midst, is, is just that this Arsenal team have definitely leveled up in terms of offense. We have seen the sort of trend in terms of underlying stats and their XG has gone up even among, amongst their peers. Previously, of course, there were positions um, previously in the season where we saw Arsenal as effectively still a top five, top six defense. And one of the biggest sort of advantages of, of course, of seeing Arsenal develop over this run and actually continue to build consistent good performances that Havertz has effectively locked down really good minutes within the team. So we're seeing much less of, let's say, Trossard substitutions. Part of that, of course, is injuries in other positions. Uh, but also, I, I think that Havertz has really built himself into an integral part of the team. Now, another thing to think about is the consideration of, let's say, Jesus and him coming back and whether that's going to have a knock-on impact on Havertz. But in general, he's been huge for the team. You can see his underlying stats are also very positive. And with this Arsenal team as well, I think he's an interesting sort of alternative towards an option like Odegaard. So I've given him a rise and also uh, contrastingly a fall for Odegaard. But I think the biggest topping, talking point is still going to be Foden. I think that I've given Foden a rise here, even though the next game or the next two games really are still tough games on paper. Now, we've talked about how this Aston Villa defense is something that we are not necessarily regarding as, as good as it is in terms of the league rank. Partially because, of course, I think a lot of the injuries that Aston Villa suffered has made them generally a worse defensive team. Their involvement in Europe as well with the lack of depth that they kind of have right now is also something that they seem to be suffering from. And Foden, of course, has also emerged as an option who has basically locked down what I would call a permanent 90 minute spot within the team. And I think the way we can see Foden is that as long as City have important games left within the season, um, he's already more important, in my opinion, to the squad than someone like Kevin De Bruyne. And I think you can see that with the Anfield substitution with De Bruyne and Foden's priority in terms of how he's getting rested in Champions League games that are completely finished or um, easier cup matches. So Foden's spot in the team is extremely secure. We're also seeing, of course, that he's more effective playing centrally. His underlying stats have also ticked up recently. And ultimately, even though the landing spot of gaming 30 on Arsenal at home isn't particularly good because Arsenal are the best defense of the league, I just think Foden is that ridiculous of a pick. And we're probably going to be looking at him as soon as gaming 30 slash 31. With Odegaard, the reason why he falls is, once again, a symptom of underlying stats. You see a lot of pairs within these price points, even at cheaper price points with better underlying stats. We don't think that he's on penalties. And even though he has um, intangibles in terms of, for example, chance creation and how that leads naturally towards bonus, I think, as we said, the emergence of Havertz as a very resolute FPL pick now is very interesting. And that sort of competes with Odegaard's viability as a pick, uh, given that you can actually have a cost saving towards him. Now, going forwards, though, in terms of the premium price bracket, nothing has really substantially changed here. I think when we talk about players like Salah, Saka, and Son, these are all locks for the short-term future. However, a lot of people will struggle still to get Salah on Gaming 30. And, and it's a question, of course, of whether they want to actually drop another key player like a Watkins on Gaming 30, which is a bit counterintuitive because Watkins has a good fixture himself, or if they actually really want to drop someone like Erling Haaland on, you know, arguably his worst fixture left in the season, which is going to be this Arsenal fixture. So there is a question to be asked about whether you want to change your premium round. A lot of people will be still looking towards moving a 30 slash 31 wildcard, which incorporates the two of these players. But one thing I'll mention is actually, even if you're trying to afford the most ridiculous team, I think there are picks like Darwin, like Isaac, and even being able to, for, for example, stretch and rotate between eight 
attackers that still um, call into question whether you might really want to go for a Tumium setup because ultimately, yes, even though we have options like Morris, even though we have cheaper options within the four positions, I, I think that some of these really valuable picks like an Isaac, like a Darwin will help you out as well in terms of creating a more well-rounded team to attack the future game weeks, as well as also have a more well-rounded team for a potential bench boost. So I do think that it, it is quite tough to still fit a Salah Holland draft um, in the short term without a wild card. And it's okay if you make that sort of executive decision to move away from Holland into Salah. And that's pretty much where I've sat down to because if you're trying to capitalize, capitalize and maximize on captaincies on gaming 30 and 31, for example, it would make more sense to side with Salah. Moving towards the forwards here, the change in landscape is, is is very static in my opinion. I think Muniz is someone that obviously, as we're starting to see more minutes for him and more confidence in, in terms of his minutes, as well as his underlying so far, we get more confident about him as a player. And, and I myself, I'm someone who likes to look at stats, but I also like to be reactive to sort of the current landscape. And the reality, of course, is that this Fulham team seem to be, you know, very much into the idea that Muniz is going to be their starting player going forwards. Now, we also know that Broya was signed on loan. We also know Jimenez is coming back to the team soon. And that might change Muniz's, Muniz's rankings um, within the cheat sheet. But right now, I think he is deserving of a yellow spot within the cheat sheet. He has a great fixture in gaming 29. It is a home fixture at the bare minimum. Tottenham, even though they looked incredible versus Aston Villa, are still a defense that we like to target at times. And ultimately, Gaming 30 is also a really good fixture once again with Sheffield United. And then the next fixture is Nottingham Forest. So if we get to see continued and really strong minutes from Muniz, I think as soon as Gaming 30, he's going to be considered, for example, a great make weight for a lot of managers. And we can see as well whether Jimenez or Broya will have impacts on his minutes, uh, depending on the result from Tottenham. One thing I'll mention too is that Unfortunately, because they were chasing the game versus Wolves, we didn't really get a per picture or a perception of, of uh, Broya's sort of spot in the team and, and whether that actually has any impact on Muniz because they were chasing the game versus Wolves. So I think that's a very specific game state where you can't really really be sure that Muniz is going to be a full-on 90-minute player. But if he is going to be a full-on 90-minute player, he's a very dangerous pick for the game. As far as Mateta, we've actually added him to the cheat sheet as well. He does black in Game Week 29, but the issue here, of course, in terms of Game Week 30 and 31 is still, I think, all the fixtures are pretty mediocre from a Crystal Palace point of view because we still view them as a pretty poor attack. However, they do expect the double in Game Week 34. So the question, of course, is do you invest into a Mateta early or do you wait until, for example, a double Game Week 34 and that to roll around before you actually invest into a player like Mateta? Right now, of course, he might sit in, in a wildcard draft that sort of is created to be a 3-5-2, but you have to still this, make that decision between, you know, whether you go for a Muniz right now or a Mateta and, and consider things like that. But Nico Jackson, he's also been added to the cheat sheet. I think the fixtures are amazing. Chelsea, of course, will have a double as well, somewhere between um, 35 and even 37 as well. And, and we also generally expect that this Chelsea team through the easier run of games that they have will do well. His underlying stats have been really positive. Yes, of course, he's not on penalties, but given that Nkunku is absent and given that there's not a, a, not not really another profile in the squad that sort of replicates what Jackson can do um, as effectively the center forward of the team, I think that Jackson's going to be a very interesting differential for, for the time being. And I think he's definitely a pick that we want to be considering as well, given that you're, you're looking at a landing spot of Game Week 30 with Burnley as well. So he's an interesting spot. But of course, he does have the diciest minutes in terms of anyone within this cheat sheet here, because I still think that Chelsea still have reasonable depth. And at times, of course, you can see Jackson sort of being deployed as almost a wing option. And you can even see, for example, Cole Palmer um, taking a center forward position uh, or, or a false nine position as well. So that sort of has some impacts on, on whether Jackson's going to have perfect minutes. But at the cost of, of course, really good underlying stats, I think it's not bad. As far as the 7.x position here, Salaki still remains at the top, still good fixtures ahead. As far as Isaac and Darwin both get rises, I gave rises to both Isaac and Darwin last week. But, you know, the reality is that as soon as Game Week 29 rolls its head around, you're going to be looking at both Game Week 30 as an option to bring in Isaac or an option to bring in Darwin. With Darwin, of course, you have the really juicy Sheffield United home fixture in the distance. We've also seen that Darwin has played minutes within the Europa League, which I think is interesting. And he also was subbed off a little bit earlier than I would expect in the City match. But I think part of that, too, is because... The, the squad still needs to rotate. People need to be given minutes. And, and Darwin, I think, is going to be starting all the all the crucial games in the future, particularly with, even within the Premier League, which, of course, is still firmly, I think, Liverpool's main ambition this season. So because of that, I think, and also simply because of Darwin's amazing underlying stats, even comparing to a lot of peers here who have taken penalty this season, therefore having inflated expected goal involvement, 
Darwin is an extremely good pick and, and ultimately a pick that I would really like. Now, of course, there there is um, a slim possibility of Liverpool having a double game week and, and, and it's more so the case that Liverpool just have really clean fixtures. And so the question, of course, is going to be whether you prefer, for example, going for and setting up in the short term to, that, let's say, maximize on game week 34 or whether you maximize, for example, on 37 where Liverpool um, could double, of, of course, in double game week 37. As far as players like Hoyland, I, I've added him back to the cheat sheet. I think we're expecting him to be back soon. We also have the international break, which will will allow for a lot of the injured players to actually make their way back into the teams. And so what's interesting about Game 30 as well is it is a spot to sort of, uh, you know, reassess, for example, Man United minutes uh, going forwards, how things have changed recently. As far as, let's say, for example, Garnacho and his position in the team, we've seen some earlier substitutions as well. So it'll be nice to see, of course, United play within um, or ahead of Game Week 34 before we actually reconsider buying back their assets. Because, of course, a lot of people have better fixtures in the short term in Game Week 30, and you can be investing instead into, let's say, Newcastle picks, Chelsea picks, or even Liverpool picks in the meantime. As far as Tony Watkins Holland, Tony, of course, is, is here as a symptom of being one of the key players for Game Week 29. Watkins still has two great fixtures left on the calendar before we, I think, consider him as a transfer out in Game Week 31. And then as far as Holland, once again, it comes back down to that question of whether you're ready to maybe part ways with um, someone like Holland if you've already wild carded, or if you're someone who actually um, is unfortunately, you know, impinged by the price point of Holland right now. The question, I suppose, is always going to be whether you can actually afford someone like Holland um, and Salah, and, and whether it makes sense, for example, to spread the funds instead. So. Going, for example, for a Holland structure, keeping that, and then instead going for options like Darwin or Isaac might make more sense, and then going for Foden as well, than let's say going for Holland and Salah, and then suddenly going um, full budget, for example, within your third striker spot, or for example, your fourth, fifth, and even maybe third midfield spots. And that's something that I think a lot of managers have to think about. I think that there's many ways to get points in reality in FPL, even though we always try to ignore and we, we think a lot about effective ownership. I think, for example, a good example of reflecting on this is, is when I, when I wildcard on Game Week 8, um, a lot of managers actually also saw that as a window to go Salah only. And a lot of people who, um, unlike me, for example, who had slightly you know richer budgets, couldn't go Holland and Salah in an effective way. And actually, they benefited a lot because some of the picks that they were able to get that are, are premiums you know, to, let's say, your cheaper picks like a Douglas Luiz, like a Trent Alexander-Arnold, for example, did profit from, from players like Trent Alexander-Arnold going on fantastic runs. And there's many routes to FPL points. And I think we need to just be aware of that before being so blind by team structures and the need to have two certain players in your team or to cover all your bases in, in terms of captaincies because of course th that is only one aspect of your team in terms of Holland versus Salah or, or, the, or the two of them being in your team you need to look at for example create creating a well-rounded team and your team can still do extremely well a good example of that myself this week is owning Bruno Fernandes which I think no no one would really dare touch um, but he was able to do well because he is still someone who posts really good underlying stats has intangibles in FPL that can get you routes to FPL points. And sometimes it can go well, sometimes it can go horrifically, which basically would be uh, most of Bruno this season. But that's um, that's FPL. Now, moving on to the defense, I don't think we have too many changes. We've added Gusto towards the top of the cheat sheet. I'm very confident about Gusto within the team. I also think that this is probably the season where even if James is to come back later in the season, that I think Gusto might still depose him potentially. Um, I think it would be very unfair to Gusto, who's played brilliantly this season. Now, we'll have to see, of course, exactly what happens with Gusto. But I think even in the short term, there are good enough Chelsea fixtures to sort of capitalize on. And I like Gusto a lot as a pick. So that's why he's been added here. Really good underlying stats as well. And simply the best Chelsea defender that you can actually opt for in the short term. Now, in the long term, I think Petrovic might actually bear out to be a better pick because he's actually at a ridiculous price point. And I also think that Sanchez, um, unlike James, for example, doesn't really have a, a chance to sort of reclaim the starting spot with in the team so that's something to think about as far as doubting Yorogi it's more a symptom of gaming 29 but with Yorogi of course a great gaming 30 whereas Doughty of course will, will sort of drop in the pecking order in weeks ahead as far as Munoz he's been added from Crystal Palace but once again more of a consideration for gaming 34 and a future transfer with Bradley we have some positive trend news in the sense that it seems like Bradley could actually play this Brent, uh, this Brighton fixture and, and maybe of course we'll continue to see Bradley play in the Sheffield United fixture as well I think Probably what we're going to see is very minimal Trent minutes and maybe just an involvement within Sheffield United at home as opposed to Trent starting it over a Bradley. So for the people who've owned Bradley and Kelleher, I think they might benefit from pot potentially giving 30 and 31, but also just worth recognizing that, you know, their, their role right now in terms of FPL could be quite short-lived, but that's also okay because you're actually invested into a player who's probably given you more than enough already in the, in the short term. As far as 
Botman, he gets rise because Newcastle's fixtures just get better. Home fixtures on the radar, and then obviously double gimmick 34. It was a barn you just to fall simply because even though you have good fixtures in the distance like gimmick 30 and 31, um, ultimately that double game week where you have Luton at home, Sheffield United at home is gone. I don't know exactly what's going to happen in the midweek fixture. Hopefully Zabani is going to be fine. Um, but yeah, I think he's a good pick at the back of your bench. And, and once again, the question will be whether, let's say a team like Wolves will have double gaming 34 on the horizon for them. If that actually does happen and that does culminate, then of course Zabani is going to be actually better um, than where he sits in the cheat sheet right now. But I think that's a 50-50 decision. We also, based on fixture planners, expect for that Wolves game to sort of be slotted in gaming 37. So it's it's a bit unlikely that Sabani is going to be an elite pick going forwards, but this is one of the cases where I think sometimes it's always worth it to transfer in a double game week player, particularly in a week where a lot of people had pretty bad defensive matchups, um, and you take your chances. I still think that within the Luton game, for example, he's got really good chances of getting a clean sheet, uh, and we'll see how that goes going forwards. As far as Poro, he gets a rise because he's he's back, he's fit, he played the previous match, and game week 30 is a brilliant fixture. Not only that, but Spurs will have some doubles later down the line, and I think they're a very crucial team where owning, for example, two to three Spurs players up until the end of the season is perfectly viable, particularly even if you're going for, let's say, a gaming 37 bench boost where they will play tough fixtures, but will be a team that you'd like to call upon. So I really do like Spurs. Um, they look like a very strong team. And the elite picks within the Spurs team are very easy to pick out, but at the same time, they're very consistent. Players like Poro, players like Madison, players like Sun, I think are very dependable. And there's no reason to sort of ignore the value that that sort of presents within FPL. So I like Poro a lot. And also in the contrast where you can see that they cover gaming 30 brilliantly in a week where, for example, City and Arsenal obviously have really bad matchups. Now, as far as Dallow and Char, these are new options. And part of that, once again, is the consideration double gaming 34. Nothing too exceptional with Dallow's immediate run of game. So I think, of course, if you're looking for, let's say, an option that might be a bit of a differential at this sort of price point, Char also presents that too. Um, and you've got Trippier as well, who's been sitting on the bench recently, but could very well come back to playing football very shortly. I did mention Livermento earlier in the video. I haven't added him to the cheat sheet because I still want to assess exactly what's going on with the Dan Byrne injury and the Trippier injury as well. But he very well could, you know, deserve a mention in the cheat sheet and could very well find you know his own spot within your fpl team particularly if you're wild card in the near future so do keep that sort of um, player on your mind particularly if you're sort of on that sort of trajectory as far as goalkeepers not many huge changes in terms of long term i've given petrovic a rise i've given Ariola kaminsky and nato a fall part of that of course is the double it's gone for kaminsky and nato and then with Ariola, of course their team is still very weak you're still looking at a bottom three, bottom four defense in West Ham, and it's overall concerning, even though one of the positives that's going for Ariola right now is that he does lead the league in terms of saves per 90. He's also been a very positive shot stopper. So when we look at a stat like PSXG per 90, he is a sort of positive performer. So it means that he's actually saving more chances than he theoretically should as an average goalkeeper. So indicating, of course, that his sort of shot stopping is above average. And the fact that he's making this many saves also means that that's sort of guaranteed to FPL points. A good example of that is just the recent game where he got 13 points. So yeah, I mean, that's something to think about with Areola, but also because we are actually going to be eyeing towards goalkeepers who play on double gaming 37 or even gaming 34, I think Areola has to drop in the pecking order unless he, let's say, gets to, to be rivaled against, you know, leading sort of XGC options like a Pickford or a Raya or even a Kelleher, for example, in the short term, who gets to prioritize gaming 30 and 31 fixtures, hopefully, before Allison comes back. As far as Vicario, I've added him to the cheat sheet because, once again, if you're, let's say, wild carding and you don't want to go for an option like Poro for whatever reason, because, of course, he might take a lot of space within your team, uh, but you're also prioritizing, for example, a keeper who doubles gaming 37, you know, in the near distance, you can consider Vicario. Ederson, of course, is injured for a month, um, but he'll probably, you know, resume duties as his sort of for, as the sort of first place goalkeeper for city in the future but you have to sort of question whether it makes sense to actually spend that sort of money on ederson now i think he's more of a sort of later transfer anyways around giving 33 or 34 so thank you guys so much for watching the cheat sheet i hope you guys enjoyed the video it was a bit of a long one i hope it sort of helps for both the free hitting managers and the people who are trying to think a little bit longer term as well in terms of their transfer plans and so on and so forth but otherwise take care and goodbye